I'm Margaret from the CBM, and this is Tim. From the CBM. And we have a whole bunch of ribosome models here that we wanted to show you just as an example of um, the sorts of models you might be making in a CREST project. So, so Tim, why don't you tell us about yeah. the, the historical stuff about this TRNA <laughs> molecule? Way back in 1974, before any of you were ever born, um, this was the, the first structure of transfer RNA was determined by Alex, Alexander Rich's lab, as well as a guy named Aaron Klug in the UK. Uh, but this was the first time we had actually a, a look at the three-dimensional structure of a nucleic acid transfer RNA. We'll just point out uh, a couple of features. The last three nucleotides at the three prime end of all tRNAs are CCA. Uh, the amino acid gets charged right onto this terminal adenosine. And then the other thing is, here's the anticodon down here. All of the textbooks that I grew up reading, learning about the flow of genetic information and protein synthesis, showed those three anticodons pointing down. It was a cloverleaf structure. It was a cloverleaf structure then. We didn't uh, know that it folded into this three-dimensional shape that exactly. still looks like a drill. Yeah. And be careful, if you ever have a chance to hold a tRNA, you never want to hold it like that That's just or right. like that. I mean, make sure it's standing up proudly like this. Very important in your use of models. So what's going on here, Tim? Well, it looks like a mess in the middle. We decided we're not going to get into those details, Margaret. Really? You the, told me how proudly we would. There, there is, uh, Margaret's talking about some triple base pairs right here in the middle. So these are Hogestein base pairs. Great example of, of that in this first tRNA structure. So look at this mess. <laughs> it looks like a terrible tangled mixture of who knows what. Uh, this is the large ribosomal subunit. Uh, it's prokaryotic, so it's the uh, 50S subunit. Yeah. This, this mess actually won a Nobel Prize for Tom Stites. Yeah, but, so. uh, but if you've never <laughs> seen it before, it's difficult to see in yes. a tangled mess. The gray is the proteins. You can see some beta sheets and alpha helices. Mm -hmm. And then the pink is an RNA. And there's also an orange RNA in this model. Yeah, there's a so large there. ribosomal and a small, uh, I think, 16S yeah, I think RNA. I don't know the numbers. Uh, Obviously, the numbers don't matter as much as the structure, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but this, you can see that the RNA uh, has some base pairing in it, but it's, it's just all tangled together. And then if you look right here, you can't see very well, there is a blue alpha helix that comes through the, the protein. This is actually the protein being synthesized. And I'll let you Let's talk see. about how the, yeah. the small subunit okay. fits in with the large. This is the small ribosomal subunit. This actually came, I think, from Harry Noller's lab. So they were one of the first groups that were able to crystallize the small ribosomal subunit along with the three tRNAs. And there's even a little yellow messenger RNA in here that you probably can't see very well. But the, uh, the interesting thing is here, this is the A site tRNA. And here's the three prime ends, so the amino acids are charged on the ends. And not surprisingly, the three prime ends of those two ch charged tRNAs then are right together in three-dimensional space because that's where peptide bond formation is going to occur. And that is catalyzed by an adenosine residue right down in the active site buried in that cleft. So the ribosome is a ribozyme. Um, Shall we show so, those how the two fit together? No, because uh, we would fumble around here for 10 minutes getting this thing together. Na in nature, they go together just spontaneously. As a physical model, they're a little more difficult to work with. Well, that's one of the problems with models. The models aren't, these models are quite flexible, mm -hmm. but they're not as flexible as they are in nature. Yeah. Uh, should we look at the models? Yeah, let's just, so, uh, so, so now, so scale. One of the things we want to do in this little video is to give you an idea as to what kinds of models, what size models you might make in your CREST project. So these, this is a small ribosomal subunit. Margaret has the large one. These are built in uh, Spaceville, 
Or are they built in alpha carbon chains? That no, like? space fill, I mean, yeah, space filled alpha carbon chains where the proteins, actually it's just the phosphate backbone in, for the nucleic acid here. They're much more colorful because here the color corresponds totally to RNA. So the white RNA in this model is multiple colors in this model. And that's because even before they had the 3D structure, they had, they had, they had divided the long ribosomal RNA into domains based on their, their imagined secondary and tertiary structures. So that's what all the color is here. The white here is actually the proteins, which are gray in this model. We've added a long messenger RNA here, which these three tRNAs are decoding. And then here's the protein coming out the back of the uh, large subunit. Should we put them together in this one? Yeah, we can start to put them together. So you, you again see a groove here, and there's an active site there. So the three prime ends of the two tRNAs would nestle in here so that they're right in that, in that groove. And again, being hard plaster, we can't mash them together. But uh, these would assemble into that 70S ribosome. As Margaret said before, the protein is made deep inside this, this uh, large subunit. So it exits through an exit channel on the backside of that subunit. And look at, look at how flat that exit channel is. That whole side of the, the ribosome is very flat. And you should think about why that is so flat when the rest of it is all globular. This portion is very flat. So think about why that happens. This is where the protein comes out. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to say about Well, that? let's show them the smaller scale of these models. So any model you design can be easily scaled just before it's built. So here's the same models built at different scales. Uh, we'll show you one more set of models here. So these three tRNAs, the A site, the P site, and the exit site of the tRNAs, these are modeled here in this uh, red ABS, three What's prime ends. ABS is just a flexible plastic so they don't break. So um, is this done on a, a, a tabletop Yeah, a tabletop that's printer? done on a filament printer, so yes. So some of you have these printers at your schools and you might want to build something like this? And here's a great example of these two different technologies because in many ways this is a much better model because it's built in color, but it's also not as good a model because it's broken because the plaster is not very, very strong. But what this shows is the A and the, and the P site tRNAs, three prime ends touching again. And, and this is a kind of model, I'm not saying you should build these kinds of models, but this then gets into some of the details that you might want to explore as you start talking about some toxins or antitoxins that are interacting, uh, say, with the small subunit right here in the A site pocket. And, and what I love about this is it shows how two tRNAs can be simultaneously docked onto two consecutive triplet codons. That is six nucleotides that make up two codons um, can be base paired in an anti-parallel manner with the anti-codon on these, these two tRNAs. Let me go back more history. When Alex Rich first described this structure back in 1974, one of the first things he said is when you look at the diameter of this barrel, and you compare it to the length of a triplet codon, which we imagine was running this way, this barrel is wider than a triplet codon. And therefore, he was puzzled as to how you could have two consecutive uh, tRNAs docked onto six consecutive nucleotides. He wasn't puzzled, I was puzzled. And I, I was convinced for some time that this was just impossible. But in fact, it's not impossible. And uh, I'm not going to tell you how nature has solved this problem, uh, but there's a clever little solution. You can see, if you look carefully at the sugar phosphate backbone, it separates one codon from the next. So hopefully, as you dive into these structures in JMOL and then make physical models of some of the structures you're looking at, these are the things that you're going you're gonna to see in a way that 
may not be clear, may be impossible for textbooks to really talk about in any detail. So Mar Mar will talk to you a little bit maybe about yes. the I'm kinds of models you might be making. Talk a little bit about, can we have the really small ribosome? This one? This one. Okay. Oh, that's actually both, you had two hats. So if you look at this size ribosome, uh, and this is, this is about the size that you'll be building your proteins. Uh, you don't see much detail here at all. So what we're thinking is that we want to build a portion of the ribosome interacting with your protein at a much larger scale so that you can actually see the molecular interactions. Uh, so it might even be larger than this scale because seeing individual amino acids is just not, or nucleotides, is not going to be very good at this scale. So what we're thinking is that a lot of you might be building a portion of, say, an RNA with a protein interacting. So for instance, if we were going to look at this particular protein here interacting with this RNA, we might just build that part of the protein, mm -hmm. but at a much larger scale so that you can see the interaction. But you won't know where this protein is located relative to the ribosome. So we're actually thinking about building a ribosome model smaller than this that would be all one solid color. Maybe it's just the 30S or the 50S, depending upon what you're modeling. And just the, the, whole, the whole ribosome, all one color except whatever color you color your protein, you have that color here, and whatever color you color the RNA would be that color here, so that if your protein interacts over here and somebody else's protein interacts over here, when you're communicating with each other, you can see, are they similar proteins? Are they functioning in a similar way pretty quickly? Uh, because we certainly don't expect everyone to know everything there is about the ribosome because there's not enough time between now and the meeting to learn it all. Uh, so we're thinking of a small scale and then a larger scale where we can see uh, the interactions at the molecular level. Uh, so as yep. you start modeling your proteins, uh, don't hesitate to contact us and we'll, we'll talk back and forth about what the design will look like. So this is a great topic. We're, we're excited about being able to explore this topic because on one hand, what is more uh, central than the central dogma and uh, how this flow of genetic information goes from DNA to RNA to protein. So it's a very basic topic that um, everyone is familiar with. And yet, the research that's going on now that continues in this area has really become very detailed and sophisticated, looking at the ways the toxins and antitoxins interact with the, the ribosome uh, in stress response and things of that sort. So it, it's going to be a fascinating topic. Uh, we look forward to hearing all of the stories that you bring uh, to the annual meeting. Good luck.